as a botnet. So just to recap a bit who I am, I am a security researcher in the global security operation of Amadeus. Amadeus is a company that uh, provides <coughs> software solutions for the travel industry, and in particular in my department, we take care of protecting web domains that are linked to the travel industry. For example, uh, as uh, we were, <coughs> as Ahmed was saying before, from attack like web scraping, and we will talk a bit also about that later. My expertise is in network and application security, and what I will uh, talk about today is based on my recent work that were done during my PhD and with some collaborations, so you can see the different parties that were involved in the work that I will present today. Amadeus Global Security Operations, Sorbonne Université, Eurecom, and Resilient Computing and Cybersecurity Center. So, now let's start understanding the problem that you wanted to tackle. <clears throat> I'm sure that every one of us is really uh, used to buy uh, goods online, be it uh, clothes, uh, tickets for event, grocery. It's something that we are uh, more and more used to do. However, we as genuine user, we are not the only people interested in the goods that are available in this uh, e-commerce website. Indeed, there are also bots that are interested in the information that is available there. And I'm not talking about bots like the one that produced the DOS or that scam ports that we can say as directly malignous bots, but not super sophisticated, but the one that are really sophisticated and sophisticated in such a way that they mimic the human interaction with a website to achieve their goal. What do I mean when say mimic human interaction? So these bots are able to reproduce a random user interaction that uh, when we use a website, we actually have <clears throat> or, for example, they are able also to solve CAPTCHA. They can be uh, doing that through AI or through redirecting the CAPTCHA to CAPTCHA farm that are physical places in which people are paid to solve the CAPTCHAs, and then the result is redirected back and uh, um, bots can actually use to access the content. Now you will be wondering why someone should build such sophisticated bots. So I will present you some example of sophisticated bot attacks. <clears throat> the first one is web scraping, as uh, we anticipated a bit. And web scraping is the activity of collecting the um, information that is available on a public um, reachable website, but in a continuous and automatic uh, way to create a large amount of requests. The attackers do that for different reasons. There could be competitor monitoring, so uh, another website want to know uh, how much uh, is price a good that they also sell to put, for example, a lower price and attract more users. Then there can be websites that want to resell the content that is available on the original website. So they want to know the base price to put a fee on top of it and sell it on this upper uh, higher price and obtain the fee. And then there are illicit aggregators. Uh, some aggregators that are those parties that take all the information available on the internet uh, regarding, for example, one product. Let's think about the aggregator that tells us uh, what are the uh, cheaper uh, sneakers. Um, usually pay this website from which they get the information about the prices to get the prices. However, there are some parties that do not want to pay and so they scrape, they continuously ask uh, um, this website for the information to then um, reuse them in their website. Now, the information is publicly available. However, using this information as in this scenario do for commercial reason is again the terms of service of the website. So even if it's not legally um, um, considered a, a malicious activity, it resides in a gray area. So we, in general, as a researcher, we consider it a malicious action. So the problem for the website that uh, has the attack is that the number of requests exponentially increase, but this is not followed by, by an increase on in the number of purchases. And indeed, uh, this is really important because usually goods in this website are uh, put with a price that enable the, um, the part that has the website to have a constant uh, ratio between request and purchases. Otherwise, the revenues goes down, as it happens in the cases of web scraping. And moreover, it can create situation of slow connections. So basically, when a lot of different web uh, scraping campaign target one single website, they can also produce uh, 
slow connection for real user and in extreme cases produce DDoS attack. Another scenario is denial on inventory. This is another type of attack that takes uh, advantage of a feature that is built uh, for us real users when we want to buy a good online. So for example, let's think that we want to buy a ticket for a concert. Usually we do all the process and then there is the step in which we pay the ticket. And, and I mean, uh, until that step, the ticket is reserved for us but still we didn't pay, but we have an amount of time, usually five, 10 minutes, in which we are um, still in the position to pay and to finally get the ticket. So the ticket is actually kind of pre-sold, even if no revenue has reached the website. So the um, bots taking uh, performing denial of inventory basically keep sending requests imitating the human activity and reaching the step of payment but they do not perform the payment um, leaving the request let's say open for five ten minutes the interval in which we keep the tickets on hold uh, in such a way to create a virtual out of stock situation so and why do they do that they do that to create a <clears throat> situation of artificial price increase decrease so in uh, many e-commerce websites when there are a lot of items available the price is low and when there are few items the price is high so some uh, of these parties basically produce the situation so the user can only buy really expensively an item or they can produce the situation and then uh, stop the attack so all the items go down to a lower price and they're sure they can buy the items at a low price and another thing is to, pre, uh, to provoke an application layer DDoS. So what does it mean? The website is actually available, but not the content of it, because the tickets are all um, seen by real people as sold, even if the actual website didn't really solve them. So these are situations in which bots really need to mimic the human interaction and provoke an attack. So, of course, websites do not want these situations to happen, so an arm race takes place every day between the websites and the bots. Uh, lately, um, more and more websites take advantage of uh, third-party anti-bot solutions that are specialized in understanding when a sophisticated bot attack takes place um, to uh, not uh, uh, have the bot uh, reach the information they want and to stop their activity. However, every time there is a new server-side bot detection technique, in some amount of time, there is a new bot detection circumvention technique. Still, it works the other way around. So it's really a cat and mouse game. And today we will talk about one of the recent developments. So on the server side, they started to check if the requests were coming from data center IPs and to block or uh, put captures, for example, on those uh, IPs. So the bots needed to have access to residential IP addresses to not be detected. And so the solution came at end to them thanks to residential proxies. Residential proxies are um, provided by um, legal companies on the market and can be used also for um, legally good action, uh, such as masquerading uh, your uh, connection, so for privacy reasons, but uh, are largely misused uh, by uh, attackers. So let's consider these parties a bit uh, in, uh, in detail. So they are larger networks of residential devices that can be uh, my smartphone, your laptop, uh, your tablet. And these devices are not owned by the company, but they belong to genuine users like us that share their usage with the company uh, for something we will see a bit later on why. The uh, important thing that is good for the bots is that there is no application layer information on the request being proxy. So from the server side, the requests sent directly from the device and the one mm, that are proxy to it are indistinguishable. So we don't have any information about this. And this creates a high probability of false positives uh, in the traditional server side bot detection technique. Why? Because this, since these devices are shared with real users, these real users can perform transactions on the same websites in which uh, the uh, residential proxy proxy the, the, the requests. And so the website can see that um, the same IP address and same characteristic um, of requests send uh, um, requests at the time, some 
for example, buy a ticket. And so uh, we know that they are genuine, while the other have some malicious uh, behavior, but we cannot be sure um, that the all IP address is compromised, so we cannot block it. And nowadays, advanced bot traffic every rely on residential IP proxies since they are so suitable for this activity. So the attacker has different advantages. First of all, it uh, this uh, residential IP proxy claim to have about six to tens of million of residential IPs, so a vast network of IP addresses, residential. As I said, these IP addresses have a good reputation, which is good for uh, passing by undetected. Moreover, there are other um, good things, because now the attacker does not have to build their own botnet, because they can just use the residential proxy to basically be a botnet. And also, since the uh, infrastructure now is shared among different parties, because one attacker is not the only client of the company, there is no direct traceability of the activity to the real actor behind the residential IP proxy. And finally, uh, these parties often uh, provide also automated solution. So, for example, they um, for an additional fee, you can buy automated capture solving. And so even not experienced developer can write really sophisticated uh, bot attacks just uh, using their these tools. How do uh, they recruit uh, devices? Because we said that these devices are residential and belong to people like me, you, and uh, so really normal people. So some of these offer free services such as FreeVPN. So you get the FreeVPN, uh, but in exchange, uh, you proxy out uh, traffic that you don't know. Some pay you with respect to the bandwidth that they consume on your device. And th these, depending on the state in which you are, can be um, illegal, reselling the bandwidth. Then uh, there are some that have specific mobile SDKs that uh, can be included by app developers in their app. So users that download this app are not always aware that this mobile SDK is there, but this mobile SDK proxy out the request. And then there are also a proof of infected devices that are used in the, um, uh, in the residential proxies. So in theory, these companies are legitimate and then can be used for legitimate usage, but still we know that there is some malicious activity connected to them. First, as we said before, there is shady device recruitment. And then thanks to previous work, we know also that the IP addresses of residential IP proxies were linked also to credential and stuffing attacks, social media spam, fast flux proxies, and crypto jacking. So this shows that uh, even if the technology, as in all cases, can be used for good things. In this case, it is also used for malicious things. So it's important to understand when this is happened to stop it. Now let's consider a bit more in detail the architecture of the residential V-proxy because we will use it for the later step. So when um, we contact our essential IP proxy, first the original client talk with a machine that we call the super proxy, which is the entry point for the request. While we call gateways, those residential devices that are used to send out the request to the website. So the original attacker send a request to the super proxy, the super proxy choose one of the available gateways at the time, and the gateway send the request to the website. And it's important, there is no application layer information about being proxy, as we said before, so the website does not know if the request comes directly, for example, now from the phone, or it is proxy through it. So in this scenario, we had an idea. We know that at the application layer, we cannot see differences. However, what happens at the transport layer? Can we use this to actually detect when a request comes directly from a residential device or its proxy through it? So this is what I will talk about today. First, um, I will present you our REST detection uh, technique based on RAM trip time measurement. And then I will talk about uh, also what we understood about RESIP in a function in modus operandi thanks of, to the dataset that we collected. So let's start from the first point. Let's first consider a direct connection. So we have a genuine users and a website. When this happens, we build a TCP session, so transport control protocol session between the genuine user and the website, and TLS, a transport layer security uh, session, will be uh, taking place between the same two parties. However, this is not the scenario that happens in residential proxy connections. 
Indeed, when we have a RACIP connection, we have one TCP session taking place between the original client and the residential proxy, and one TCP session between the gateway and the website. These two sessions are also not synchronized among them. We did some experiment to confirm this. So they're really independent among each other. But as in the direct connection, the TLS is end-to-end -end between the real client behind everything and the website. So this shows us that there is a difference actually between the direct connection in which the TCP and the TLS take place between the same parties and the receive connection in which the TCP2, that is the one we see with the website, and the TLS takes place with different parties. So this is clear, but what we want to do is to recognize this only from the server side, so from the website point of view. So how can we do that? We, take, we can take advantage of the round trip time. The round trip time is the time for a packet to go from one party, for example, the website, to the second party, the genuine user in the case of direct connection, and for the corresponding answer packet to come back to the website. So in the first scenario, the red connection, when we have a TCP packet and a TLS packet, the two packets are sent uh, and the corresponding answer uh, back between the same two parties. So the round trip times of these two packets are comparable among them. However, we have a different scenario when we have a receive connection. Indeed, the TCP packet just uh, travel till the essential device and come back while the TLS one need to reach the user and then, I mean, the answer come back. So in theory, the round trip time at the TLS layer for receive connection should be much higher than the round trip time at the TCP one. So we had this idea, but of course uh, we needed to check. So we, we needed to uh, do a measurement campaign to understand if our intuition was right. So we uh, obtained two client server machines in 11 locations all around the world to understand if uh, machine in the same place had uh, similar characteristics for the receipt and also to have um, geographical uh, spread collection. We bought the services of four receipt providers among the most used, uh, Braid Data, Xilab, ProxyRack and Smart Proxy. For four months, we sent requests for each client to each server directly and also passing through the receipt providers, and we collected measurements. And in total, we collected more than 92 million connections. So let's consider the data collection from one client, for example, client 01, in the case of receipt connection, uh, we want to connect to server 02 passing through receipts 3. So recip 3 will choose a super proxy, super proxy Z, and a gateway, gateway I, that will be used to send the request. So in the client, we will send an HTTP connect request with source IP client 01 IP and destination IP, the one of super proxy Z, with a URL that uh, encode uh, the uh, code of the client, the recipe that we use, and the code of the server. Why? Because at the server, what we see is just a request coming from the source IP of the gateway with the URL. So we need to use the URL to um, get the information on which client and which proxy we were uh, studying. So thanks to this, uh, we were able to link our logs. And then at the server side, of course, we take our measurement of the two round trip times to then perform uh, our evaluation. Let's consider the um, results. So let's first define the delta round trip time as the difference between the round trip time at the TLS layer and the round trip time at the CP1. In case of the red connection, the two round trip time should be similar. So the delta round trip time should be really small. In case of recipe connection, we expect the round trip time TLS to be much higher than the round trip time TCP. And so this delta round trip time should have value much higher than zero. So, uh, let's first start from the red connections and let's uh, uh, first understand uh, what are we looking at. Um, here we will have a plot uh, in which on the x-axis we will show the delta round trip time in milliseconds and on the y-axis the number of connections. So each point in the plot will, have, will be uh, the number of connections that have that specific delta round trip time. And here we can see the plot. We can see that the majority of the red connection have a delta round trip time that is much uh, um, 
clo really close to zero, the majority is lower than five milliseconds. And pay, let's pay attention to the extremes of the axis. We have chosen the uh, x-axis between 0 and 20 milliseconds, and it's the um, interval in which we have 97% of the red connections. And moreover, on the y axis, we can see that mul we multiply for 10 to the power of 7. This really shows that the, um, the curve is really or um, near the uh, zero uh, value, um, and it's concentrated there. Now let's consider the recipe connection and we plot them with an x-axis with delta ram trip time in which we can represent 97% of the recipe connections. Here you can see that we have much different shapes that are all uh, more spread on the x-axis that it's really different also because it's between 0 and 2000 milliseconds. So uh, 100 times more what we had in the direct connections. Moreover, if we look at the y axis, we see that the multipliers are lower, 10 to the power of 3 and 10 to the power of 4. This means that really the shapes are much more spread, and so we can see a real difference. So uh, we call our detection ram trip time detection, since it's based on this measurement. And thanks uh, to solving an optimization problem to minimize false positive, we um, define uh, the threshold for determining that a connection is recipe uh, if the delta ram trip time is greater than 50 milliseconds. Moreover, we needed to check also if there could be impacts on the detection technique. So we studied uh, the packet speed of uh, the different connection and the TLS version. So we studied both TLS 1.2 and 1.3 to understand if this could be a bias. And we saw that there were no impact. So in any scenario, the uh, results uh, were consistent to what I showed you before. Then we considered the client processing time. Indeed, the RAM trip time takes uh, information about the path taken by the packets. So the distance between the parties, but also it uh, needs to be processed at the client. So does this make a difference? So we did uh, a different experiment with different browsers and hotspot and different conditions. And we saw that when we use browsers instead, for example, of a Python script, or we have an hotspot um, connection to a Wi-Fi, this increased the difference that we see between the RAM trip time TLS and the RAM trip time TCP, but this remains below our threshold of 50 milliseconds for the red connection. So it does not uh, um, provide the false positives. And then we consider situation of network delays and the geographic location of the party. So in situation of network delays, what can happen is that the um, RAM trip time, for example, of a recipe connection uh, in the TCP uh, session is higher than what would normally be, and so the uh, connection is not, an, is not seen as recipe. And the geographic location of the parties, um, when all the parties, so the client, the server, the super proxy and the gateway are close by, is a difference uh, that is created by the forwarding of the TLS packets among the different parties enough to still see a difference with the direct connection. So in our study, we saw that there are small increase in false negatives. Um, so there are some recipe connections that do not pass through our test, but the vast majority of it, uh, more than 76%, actually are still detected by the technique. And uh, these are really unlikely case to happen. So these uh, show that our technique is robust. So since uh, we had good result with the technique, we managed to implement this in the real world. This also because the technique is different from any other current antibot techniques on the market, uh, because uh, the current one provide the JavaScript insertion that needs to be run on the client, or they work uh, clustering parameters, for example, on the headers, while our technique study request by request that arrive to the server, does the measurement, and based on this value, we can uh, perform um, the detection. Uh, Amadeus convinced an anti-bot third-party company to implement the technique. Uh, so nowadays, in this third-party company, the technique is available. And our analysts are currently using the feature to detect tracing campaign using it alone, standalone or in combination with other parameters. Why in combination with other parameters? Because during our real-world implementation, we actually understood that there were some false positive 
we didn't consider before. Let's uh, look into that. In specific, uh, these were first positive caused by mobile connections. So connection performed through mobile networks. And this happens because of the existence of mobile TCP terminating proxies. So let's consider a scenario in which we have a mobile connected device that want to reach a website. The mobile first need to reach the antenna and the connection between the mobile and the antenna is done through electromagnetic waves. This is not uh, the best for preventing packet loss. Indeed, electromagnetic wave connections um, create a lot of packet loss, while the wire connection between the antenna and the website prevent this. So some mobile uh, providers do this. They break the TCP session at the antenna, creating one TCP1 and one TCP2. So if a packet is lost between the mobile device and the antenna, the time for retransmitting is much lower than to retransmit it to the website. However, they don't do the same with the TLS session to not uh, decrypt the packets and not break privacy. So we have two TCP sessions and one TLS one. If you pay attention, this is a similar scenario to what we had with a SIP connection. And indeed, in this scenario, when we calculate the round trip time, the one of the TLS is higher than the one at the TCP layer. However, there is a difference. The mobile connected device is near the antenna because we connect to the closest antenna to us. And moreover, the TCP session is, yes, broken, but it's broken on the path. Instead, when we have a receive connection, uh, the TCP is broken and there is a detour of the packets um, with respect to the path that uh, the packets will take if the connection was direct. For example, the client can be in Europe, the server or the website can be in USA. If uh, there is a mobile connection, the direct connection Europe, USA is broken, but still the path is the same. If there is a recipe and the recipe is in Africa, for example, the packet goes from Europe to, uh, Europe to Africa to uh, US. And so there is a much larger latency. So our intuition was that, yes, the delta ram trip time it could be higher than our threshold in this case, but is smaller than the average recipe one. So we did uh, both semi-controlled and real-world data connection to prove this, and uh, we confirm our assumption. So uh, we, um, in case in which we see a mobile connection, we hire the threshold to understand if it's a recipe or not. And in this way, we can lower false positives. Now, uh, let's consider if there is the possibility for the attacker using residential IP proxies to prevent our detection. So one thing is that we take advantage of TLS measurements, so we need to have a TLS session. So one option would be to downgrade the connection from HTTPS to HTTP. So we, um, we do not allow to downgrade HTTP connection to HTTP on our domain, and we advise not to let this happen if anybody wants to use the technique. But also there is a possible generalization. Instead of considering the RAM trip time at the TLS layer, we could uh, build some measurement uh, take it advantage of HTTP, HTML object that we can send to the client and need to be resent back. Uh, there are some works uh, that talks about this. Um, so in theory, this uh, uh, is possible. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any implementation so far, but the general concept is available. Then the most basic thing to do for the attacker would be to break the TLS session in two. So the residential proxy would decrypt and re-encrypt the packets. And so we would not see that this uh, um, forwarding of the TLS packets take place anymore. This is technically feasible, but we believe unlikely to happen for different reasons. First of all, the client, so the malicious actor behind the receive, would need to accept a root certificate for the gateway. Uh, that uh, would enable the gateway to impersonate any server in the world. This gives a lot of power to the gateway that is under the control of the recipe, which is not the real attacker in this scenario. Then the gateway device will have access to the content that is required, requested by the client, so the uh, malicious actor. This uh, would enable them to modify them, 
but also just even to check it and so to understand if malicious activities are actually performed. And moreover, it would increase the workload of the gateways. And if you remember, these gateways are essential devices that belong to real people like us, and they are generally applications. Uh, so if they become computationally expensive, the end user is most likely uh, prone to actually cancel the uh, application if uh, it drained the battery, for example. And so it also will be um, something that uh, the residential IP proxy would need to consider. Moreover, another point is that the real attacker is not the residential proxy, but is the party behind. So the residential proxy um, most likely have many scenarios to take uh, in account and do not answer to the specific characteristic of each of the attacker. Another way that we could think would be to delay the TCP packets that are sent at the gateway. So the TCP packet starts at the uh, web... Um, at the uh, website, it reached the gateway, and then the gateway keep it and send it back just when the TLS answer come back from the client. However, for how they are built today, essential IP proxies, this is not feasible because Recip just work at the application layer, so they do not have any con direct control of uh, the uh, transport layer, uh, which is something that only if you have control of the gateway can do. But these devices are owned by um, real people that just download an app that cannot uh, uh, tackle with the kernel of the device. So for all these reasons, um, the technique is pretty robust and uh, it's still uh, um, working. So, once uh, we cover the technique, uh, we can uh, also think that uh, during our four-month collection, we collected a lot of uh, recipe connection. And we need to keep into account that, uh, yes, now we have a technique that uh, can understand when we have a recipe connection. But as we said at the beginning, it's an arm race. So, every time there is a new technique, in some time there will be a way to uh, avoid it. So we use all the data that we uh, collected to build the knowledge about these parties. And so let's uh, go and understand a bit more what happens inside the residential proxy. So uh, just to recap, we did our analysis on four recipe providers. Uh, we had 69 million plus recipe connection, 92 million if you consider the direct one, but in this uh, specific part of the presentation, we do not consider them because we're interested in the residential proxies. We analyze IP addresses and uh, transport layer measurement we performed. And we obtain three types of finding. First, about how they assign the gateways, so the residential devices that are used as uh, endpoint to send the request. How their machines uh, is distributed, which types do they have access to, and the management of them. And also the amount of the machines. Let's start from the first point. So, one first finding is that the residential proxy minimizes the gateway IP repetition in a single client-server path. So, if we look to the plot on the right, we can see on the x-axis the server code, so the code of our machine, and on the y one, the number of unique IP addresses uh, that they were used uh, uh, as gateways when the server was that machine. We can see that uh, the different colors are the for recipe, uh, for each recipe, the value is constant. You can see that for machine from 17 to 22, the count is lower but constant in that. And this happens because uh, we started that collection a bit uh, later uh, with respect to the first machine, so we have uh, less connection for those machines. And also you can see that the red provider has a much lower count than the others. This happened because we were forced to stop that subscription. But in any case, what we want to see in this plot is that the amount is constant. So, independently to different factors, each machine more or less um, receives connection from gateways with um, a unique, uh, a distinct amount of IP addresses. Moreover, if we sound... Uh, sorry. Still presenting? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. I heard something, sorry. Um, okay, no, nope. uh, 
So if we sum together all the um, unique IP addresses that we have for each server, we obtain a number of unique IP addresses that is much higher to the number of unique IP addresses if we calculate all together. So this tells us that Recip minimizes the repetition for a single server, but actually on the global picture, they reuse the IP address many more times. So this is an interesting finding because it tells us that if um, one actor want to target one server and want to maximize the number of IP addresses they use, they should actually uh, just use one client. Then uh, we studied, because we had two machines for each location, we studied if between these two machines there was an amount of repetition that was higher uh, than the amount of repetition that we had uh, between any other random couple of machines. Uh, this would mean that the geolocation of the server with respect to the gateway one will take, uh, um, would, would be important for that. Uh, so we checked that and we saw that there was no correlation. Uh, so this uh, tells us that there is uh, no direct correlation between the um, geolocation of uh, uh, these two parties. This shows us more in general, these two points, that there are similarities in the implementation and strategies for all analyzed recipe providers. And this is also uh, supported by the technique that, we, that I presented before, because the difference in the RAM trip time was a common thing for all providers. However, there are also differences. And let's consider the machine distribution type and management. So first of all, let's consider the gateways and where they are located in the world. Here in the plots, you can see with an higher shade, um, deeper shade of blue, if in a country there were more gateways than others. So we can see that Bright Data Proxy Rack really differ among themselves and with Oxilab and Smart Proxy on the right. But Oxilab, um, Obsilabs and Mars, Smart Proxy actually have a really similar picture, and this is not a mistake, it's actually what happens. So, these two providers have gateways that are available in the same uh, geographic areas. Moreover, we checked the Super Proxy. So, the Super Proxy is the machine at the beginning of the connection, the one the uh, client connects to. And we saw that there was a really different way to manage them. Bright Data had a high number of IP addresses associated to their super proxy domain name. And remember that Bright Data is the actor for which we had the lower data. While Oxila, ProxyRack, and Smart Proxy have a, a fixed amount of IP addresses, their domain name for the super proxy resolved to. Then we considered the, the um, distribution of the OSs of the gateways. To obtain this information, we use the time to live of the packets because different operating systems set the initial value of this um, of the time to live to different values. And from we can see from the table, we can see that while Oxilab and Smart Proxy have a prevalence of time to live equal to 64 as starting value, ProxyRag has an initial time to live of one, uh, 128 for the majority of the devices. We're not able to do this uh, collection for Bright Data because we did uh, this uh, experiment only in a second part of the campaign. And uh, this result shows us that the different providers have access to different uh, category of devices uh, in the countries that uh, they get the gateways. And uh, last of the category, we check the diurnal patterns in the usage of gateways. So, as you can see in the plot, uh, we uh, took uh, the connection done from each gateway and we check at which time in the time zone of the gateway uh, the connection was performed. You can see on a dashed line in the middle of the plot uh, the um, threshold that we would uh, expect to have for all the points uh, if uh, um, the there was no diurnal pattern. Because on the x-axis we have uh, the hours of the day and on the y-axis uh, the percent of connection that were sent at that time. So. You can see in blue and uh, uh, purple that uh, these two plots are really close to the um, so-called threshold. And so it means that there was no pattern, while uh, the red and the green provider actually show a diurnal pattern with a um, much lower number of requests sent when the gateways were in an hour, uh, in an early hour of the day while uh, in the second part of the day, there were much more connections. 
So this shows that the device that they have they, they had access to uh, were actually more available during uh, uh, the second part of the day. In general, all this information tells us that there are differences among the providers. And this is also a good point because we can detect them with a common technique, but also we can um, build attribution technique uh, based on the different characteristics that we see from uh, their, um, their IP addresses and their measurement. And so we can understand which of the specific parties actually targeting us. And now let's uh, consider the amount of machine. So um, we check if there were shared IPs among the different providers. So in this table, you can see uh, the amount, uh, the percentage of uh, shared IP address with uh, um, considering that for each line, we have the number of shared IPs on the total amount of IPs of that provider. So that's why there is a mismatch between the, in the diagonals. We can see that there are some overlap and this can make sense because one device can have the application for different recipe providers or they, there can be different devices with um, the uh, software of uh, each of these behind the same NAT. So at the end, the IP address is the same. However, we see in gray that there are two percentages that are really high that are the overlap between Oxilab and Smart Proxy. And this, uh, this tells us that these two parties have the IP pool, or at least a large part of it, in common. This is a really important information because it's different to think that there are hundreds of recipe providers out there with tens of millions of IP addresses at their disposal that do not uh, um, overlap with the tens of millions of another provider, or if there are big overlap because then the uh, total amount of IP addresses we will need to pay attention of is much smaller. And also we uh, try to understand what was actually this number of IP addresses. So we, um, we took our data um, and uh, we consider that uh, um, since we did a campaign for four months for three out of four providers, so we did the uh, analysis also only for these three providers, we could consider that if the situation was uh, stable, so the um, number of new devices added to the uh, essential proxy would be similar to uh, the number of uh, the device they do not work with anymore and the different IP churns, we could actually project in time uh, the number of IP ads that we would see. So we uh, found the curve that best uh, approximate our data distribution. And we, here we can see the um, projection in time. We can see that uh, um, the uh, three providers do not reach tens of millions of um, IP addresses as it's advertised on these websites. So um, for the moment, our data do not uh, um, show uh, that the claim of this website are real. And this tell us that the number of IP addresses should, could be much lower than what we expect. This is another important information that we have to take into account because this could lead us to possibly build suspicious list of slash 24 blocks that are used by recipe providers and most likely they are shared by different recipe providers and that uh, we can pay attention to, to understand uh, if, uh, um, there, there is malicious activity. So um, this uh, was all, and I will recap what I talk about today. So I presented to you a new technique based on ram time measurement to detect recipe connections. I showed you a novel insight about the recipe ecosystem and their functioning. Uh, we saw similarity and differences among different providers, but um, most uh, important and something that I would like to leave for also for the result because we are working on it, but uh, maybe some of you is interested in um, in continuous to work on this topic. In that case, contact me, we can uh, talk about it. We have new direction for prevent recipe malicious uh, usage, such as the analysis of the IP addresses. So this is all. Uh, thank you very much. I put in the slide the um, citation for the work that uh, uh, are part of this uh, of this presentation. You can also scan the QR code to check them. And if you have um, any question, I'm happy to answer.